Hello, Memphis. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, doing good. Doing good. How are you? Excellent. Yeah, no, I'm really good. I'm really excited for this interview and the music we've got in store and just learning all about you as a musician. Um, and speaking of music, let's go for your first song, which is I Was Young When I Left Home. Could you tell us about this song before we hear it? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a fairly simple folk song that feels like it always existed, you know, which is a good definition of a folk song. Um, but sometimes you find these songs and you just really relate to them and you you feel like you wish you'd written them, but also an optimistic part of your brain thinks, actually, if I'd been in the right headspace, I, I could have wrote a song with a similar sentiment, maybe not that same song, but um, you find a song that says exactly what you wanted to say. And that was the case with this song.
So we've just heard your sound in that song, but if you were to describe your sound to someone who's never heard you before, how would you describe it? I would say it's it's a fairly traditional Celtic folk sound, um, and it is the the content that maybe makes it a bit a bit uh, different to to other uh, folk musics. Um, so uh, there it's. Uh, a tuning that I play in on guitar, which is dadgad. I'm not a a, a strict dadgad player. I've, I've I switched between uh, that and standard tuning a lot. But dadgad is is known as the the Celtic tuning. Is um, it? Oh. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, it, I think it comes from Ireland originally, Sligo, maybe. Um, don't quote me on that, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, very much associated with with Celtic music and. Um, what I like to do is try and work um, American songs and root music and country music into this kind of dadgad style. Um, that's not what I've always done, but in the last few years, that's been a big part of what I do. Could um, you say then that you're kind of Celtic Americana or Scottish Americana or something like that? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, but I, what I try and do is, is try and finish the, the circle, you know, so um, Scots Irish took their their music and their whiskey and culture over to to the mountains and um it it became something else um and all i i'm trying to do is um bring it bring it back around much in the style of uh, say the transatlantic ses- sessions yeah. um, which which i kind of grew up on in your album that you've currently got in the works called field recordings from pangea you said that there's like a background to that that connects them even more yeah, um, this came about quite randomly. So I've been working on this album for a while and it's always been, I want to do an album of Appalachian songs um, and I've, it's taken me far too long. Uh, but in this process, um, I, I'm a bit of a documentary fiend. I, I, I love watching documentaries on anything. And uh, I think I was watching one about uh, geology or something um, or, or kind of the history of the continents on the planet yeah. and how they shifted and moved. And uh, when all the continents were combined, uh, you know, millions and billions of years ago, they're like a supercontinent um, called Pangaea. And on that continent, there was a mountain range. And when it split apart, that mountain range became the Appalachian Mountains and the Scottish Highlands. So the cultures are connected um, through music, um, you know, through writing, but also through geology. And that kind of cemented what I was doing for me I was like right okay yeah I, I know I'm in the right place um it, it all it all kind of fell into place so talking more about this album what sort of musical ideas can we see on it so you can see me reworking um traditional ballads um from that region into my own style uh so I, I try and rework them onto dadgad guitar um and then deliver them in a way I would deliver any any other folk song, which I feel like is, is kind of my job is to just deliver songs to people, you know. Um, and uh, so the meanings will stay the same, but the, the kind of timbre, I guess, well, is, is the bit that I work on. Um, so you still have these sentiments of like love and loss, um, lots of grief, you know, <laughs> um, all these cheery uh, folk subjects but uh, reworked into my own style. Yeah. And why is it that you want to do this? Why are you trying to like almost celebrate the, the connection between these two areas? Interesting. Um, <laughs> I, I've, I love country music. Uh, I, I always have. Um, I've always felt a, a kind of uh, connection to America. Um, and, and I guess... Growing up in kind of rural Scotland, you get a lot of people. Um, I I can remember people like meeting American tourists, claiming Scottish heritage, you know, um, which is kind of like a cliche now and yeah. um, almost a bit cringe at times. Um, but what I what I learned from a very young age was that there is this connection between Scotland and America, between Ireland, and North England, you know, between the Celtitude and America and uh, I you know I, once I kind of discovered Americana which is such a wide term um, 
you know, I just kept finding little pockets of music that I absolutely loved and realized that, um, you know, you could explore, you could explore Americana forever, you know, uh, and you could with, with Scottish folk music as well. Um, but I really enjoy this journey, like I said, of trying to con finish this circle. Um, yeah. And it, it lets me indulge in my favorite things, which is um, folk <laughs> music from my own country and um, Americana. So exactly. I, it's just, and why it, wouldn't you want that? It's yeah. me being quite selfish, really. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but something yeah. nice comes out of it. And speaking of something nice coming out of it, when is this album coming out? Uh, about a year ago. Uh, oh. <laughs> it, it, no, it's 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 just taken me ages. Oh, it's, yeah. taken, it's taken me much longer than it should have done. Um, but you know, you've you've got to work. Uh, I, I think if if I had the luxury of time, yeah, it would have been finished a long time ago. Um, but you know, and if it's a uh, labour of love, it does tend to take a lot longer than you think. It's not something you can just bash out. You've got to really work on it because it's yeah. Something you're passionate I, about. And actually, what in the last year or so, um, I've I've gigged these songs a lot, and in the process, when you when you play stuff live, they always the songs always slightly change to yeah. um, make the live setting work work for you. Um, often the way it goes is you you record the songs and then you go and play them live, and by the end of the tour, the songs are are different to the recordings. Yeah. So I'm I'm hoping to kind of bypass that and uh, be able to get the songs fully finished in their full forms and then record them and but they, they it's, it's almost fully recorded um and then once that's done and mastered it won't be much longer after that so i'm i'm hoping you know um no later than september oh i'm so excited though because i haven't seen anything like this before i see people exploring both of the different traditions but not doing that full circle thing and there's something so satisfying about a circle don't it well, is, but... I'd have to, I'd have to recommend uh, transatlantic sessions. There's there's weeks of footage on YouTube, uh, and it, it's it's amazing. They they they're, they're doing it. They're living it. They're they're taking American yeah. musicians over to Scotland, and you have these American players players playing Scottish and Irish tunes, um, Scottish musicians playing American tunes, and there's just there's a magic about it. And um, that that TV show is is was a big influence for me. Uh, definitely. Brilliant. Well, let's now go for your second song. Um, okay. And for this, we've got If I Were a Carpenter. Can you tell us about this one? So this is a Rambling Jack Elliott song. Uh, Rambling Jack Elliott was prolific tourer, songwriter, just um, the real deal. And this song always stuck out to me as one of my favourites. And it's one where I really indulge in the the bluegrass side of things and um i'm still playing in dad gad guitar so i have to kind of figure out these bluegrass licks and movements in, into a different tuning but i think it really works and i like how the guitar hums through it and um yeah i, I just think it's a great song <laughs>
dancing with Would you still love me? Answer me, baby, yes I would And I think you love me Your love of folk music really began when you moved from Fife to Argyll in Scotland. I don't know if that was necessarily the location or the age that I moved at where I was just really like exploring music, but definitely going to Argyll and seeing folk music being played in pubs and being seeing folk music as part of a community activity uh, was a big influence for me. Yeah. And what was different yeah. about the scenes in Fife and Argyle? Or did you not even really know the scene in Fife at all? Going back to Fife now, there, there definitely is a difference. Um, yeah. There's a really strong Scots tradition along the East Coast. Um, I, I would say the, the West Coast tradition, from my point of view, is um, feels a lot livelier. Um, and I just got sucked into it more. Um, so I, I I wouldn't want to say what the differences are because they're, they're all, 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 both got great qualities in their own right. Um, but yeah, for me, the, the, the West Coast scene really just drew me in and there was yeah. like a, a, an emphasis on having fun, <laughs> you know, and uh, an openness, you know, the, kind of, the, the gates open, come on in type thing. Yeah. And uh, every, everywhere I went, I was welcome. Even when, once I moved to Glasgow, um, you know, you, you can go to sessions in Glasgow and there'll be some of the best best musicians in the, in the country just sat around playing tunes and, and they will welcome you with open arms, no matter what your level. Um, so I, I'm grateful to, to, to all those people who let me sit in and, uh, and learn, you know, I, I learned how to play guitar in pubs in Glasgow. Yeah. <laughs> so it really is a community uh, there in Argyle. Yeah, uh, 100%. Um, there's a bunch of folk festivals, um, there's seafood festivals, um, whiskey festivals, music festivals, you know, and, and it just, through the summer in Argyle, I mean, the place really quietens down in the winter, but through the summer, it's, it's nonstop. There's always yeah. something on, there's always something to engage with. Um, so, so yeah, if, if you don't really need to look that hard for it. You'll, you'll find it. <laughs> 
And you mentioned pubs, which I think is quite an important thing to look at. What is it about pubs that kind of works with folk music and that was like a, an important part of getting you into folk music? There's a, there's a whole culture in, in pubs uh, for folk music. It, I feel like it's a place where the community decides what tunes they're listening to at the moment, what tunes uh, matter in, yeah. in, the, in the scene. Um, and, and a lot of the time I would find myself just learning tunes from the, from the pub that I'd heard and, you know, I'd be like, oh, what, what tune is this? And I'd make a note of it. And then I'd go and learn it the next week. You can go in and you can join in. Um, and also you're playing a lot of the time, if it's, if it's a good session, you'll be playing tunes that people who are at the session have written, which I, I think is just the nicest thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, there definitely is this community feel. And I don't think, I think we should be grown up and say like a, the drink has a lot to do with it as well, <laughs> as well. you know, um, letting people kind of, um, put their guard down and, and just have a good time. I, I yeah. think it's really important to folk music. Um, a lot of the time I find it gets caught up in being proper and, um, I think engaging with it um, in the pub, you know, no one's filming it. No, you're not playing a gig. People are there because they want to be there and they, they want to play music and have a drink, you know. Um, and I actually, I struggle to find good sessions these days. So it's one thing I really miss. Yeah. Uh, but I, I'm really grateful that for that for that kind of window that I had witnessing all of that, you know. <laughs> and it was that window that then helped you like take it further because you didn't just keep it as a hobby which would have been um a very easy thing to do you actually went and did like and had an education in folk music um where was it that you you studied folk music so i studied at newcastle well i did a year in glasgow uh, at college and then i did a bachelor's at newcastle in, in folk music yeah um which on, honestly was amazing i actually they had a uh like an anniversary event recently um and newcastle uni has, has created an entire world of, of folk music you know yeah um and it's really it's, it's really special uh, Absolutely. and there's not there wasn't many places doing it beforehand i think there's maybe two or three other folk degrees kind of back university degrees that you can get in the country um so yeah and i, I think a lot of people maybe look at it as a kind of mickey mouse course maybe you know folk music but actually what we're doing is um, making sure that certain traditions don't die um, mm -hmm. and the, the practical side of things um, you know I, I had lessons with uh, Chris Newman who yeah. uh, incredible guitarist and he was a big influence on me he he plays a lot of bluegrass a lot of Americana um, still goes over to um, I, I think it's Nashville every year to do these guitar camps um and and honestly I, I would have gone to uni just just for the lessons with him you know all, all the academic stuff aside being able to sit with um chris every every week was was amazing um mm. so i i, I think it, it's really you know the practicality of it was what i took away what was what i took away most from if yeah. that makes sense and why was it that you decided to do it academically rather than just a hobby? I wanted to go to uni. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I thought I should go to uni, you know. And obviously at this point, this was before the tuition fees. I'm showing my age a little bit. But um, it was a much easier option. You know, I, I could, I, I, I was, it was all funded, you know, Um and you know we could get into the politics of that, but it's probably for a di for a different interview. Um, but it's what I loved. There was a course in it. You know, it's not too far from home, Newcastle. Uh, so I I just went for it. You know. Yeah. No. And um, for any of the the people watching, I also went to Newcastle Uni, and absolutely loved it. So I second everything that Melissa <laughs> said. It's yeah, just it's yeah. a really great place, and. Um, you're right. It's it's important because it does keep traditions alive, and I learned so much about traditions that 
I didn't know existed. And so it's, it's important for folk music to have places like that, I think, to keep it going. Um, obviously, the oral tradition is the best way, but sometimes you have to do it in this fast paced world. You have to have an actual education in it to keep things going. Um, it's such a, I mean, I mean, it is an academic subject, folk music. It's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's the study of, of human beings and how they um, communicate culture. And I, I think it's a really important thing to study. My, my favorite academic side of the course was um, ethnomusicology. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which I used to, which was heavy. It, it was a lot, you know, but I, I loved these field recordings, um, you know, and how universal music is um, and how it gets kind of uh, disseminated yeah. um, and shared. I, I just think it's endlessly fascinating and uh, it tells us tells us a lot about ourselves. And for anyone who doesn't know what ethnomusicology is, how would you describe it? I mean, if I was to have a go, I'd say like the the telling of a people through its music or by st- you learn about a group of people by studying their music. Do you, would you say that that's correct? I think that's a pretty good definition. Maybe like um, anthropology, but w- through music. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pretty much. Yeah, it's yeah. great. Um, but although you you went to uni, you loved uni, but at the end of your third year, weren't you a bit of a rebel? <laughs> something to do with Rob Heron and the T-Pan Orchestra. Didn't something you, happen there? <laughs> who have you been talking to? <laughs> uh yeah, they, they basically wouldn't let me go on tour, uh, pretty much. And my argument was, well, I'm here to be a musician, to learn how to be a musician. And here is an opportunity to actually go and live that. And so I just went anyway. I, I just I just went. And uh, no one was happy about that, <laughs> really. But, you know, I, I'm glad I did. I'm, I'm glad I did. Do you think that it was quite a turning point that moment in like taking you into a professional musician? Yeah, definitely. Um, in loads of ways, but I, I, ultimately, I just wanted to do it. I just loved the thought of, of playing shows every day, you know. And I don't think I was at a stage in my life where I was thinking a lot of things through. I was just doing stuff, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the opportunity was there, and yeah, I just went for it. Why not? You know. Let's now have your your third song, Red Rocking Chair. What's this song about? Uh, this is uh, comes from an old Scottish song about uh, losing your lover. Essentially, it's a it's a grief song. Um, the the symbolic red rocking chair is debated about the meaning of it, um, whether it means. Um, so I've, I've seen some accounts where people say it's about losing your lover to prostitution. Um, yeah, I know, which is obviously a great, a great folk topic. Um, yeah. <laughs> but but in, in my head, it's about um, losing, about grief. It's a grief song. Oh, when you're gone, yeah, I'll rock the cradle. 
And the Teapan Orchestra was your first experience of was it of being paid to be a performer? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and so ever since then, you've held a professional music career. Um, do you think that having a professional music um, a professional music career as a folk musician is a sustainable career choice? No, don't do it. It's. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, it is. You just have to, you have to do a lot. You have to like have uh, lots on the go all the time. Yeah. Um, and it's seasonal, you know, work kind of drops off in the winter. Um, but as long as you, if you've got different, you know, I do a lot of teaching, um, which helps. Um, but yeah, like the, the live shows, they, they, they dip in how much you make. Um and so that's why I do a lot of session work as well, um, which I, I love doing. Um, gives me an excuse to to play electric guitar and uh, like rock out and stuff, you know. Um, Speaking of session work, haven't you got something coming up with Elephant Sessions? Yeah, I've been doing a, f a few shows with them. Um, so that's been honestly amazing. And uh, uh, I've, I've known the boys for ages because a couple of them went to Newcastle Uni as well. Um, I actually used to live with the bassist in, in Phenom. Uh, so, uh, I mean, also, yeah, I mean, talking about making a living, like it is, it's a lot of networking and yeah. being lucky with who you know and stuff. And I have been lucky in that sense. Um, but honestly, I absolutely love it. And, and they get amazing shows booked and they've got this whole lighting thing. And um, yeah, it's not shows like I've ever played before, but um, I absolutely love it. You know, and they're they're uh, Smiley and Tails and and Seth and Greg. They're they're all um, incredible musicians, like really top tier, and I'm uh, very grateful to be part of it. Yeah, and so obviously you've got all of these these pies. Do you have a favorite <laughs> pie <laughs> that you got your finger in? <laughs> Making music, doing doing arrangements of. Um, of, of songs is, is what I, is what I like to do. And I, I think that's what I'm best at is, um, yeah. taking music, reworking it, um, and then kind of putting it back out. Or I, I love to write as well, writing music. Um, and then everything else is kind of like work, you know, um, yeah. not, not in a bad way. I, I love my work. Do you think it's a bad thing that folk musicians don't get like the fame and fortune that you might get in other genres? No, no. I think 
the folk scene at the moment is better than it's ever ever been um, and because they don't get the fame of of say like pop musicians uh, you, they're not limited by um, the creativity is not limited by record labels um, by like three minute radio friendly hits you know folk musicians can do whatever they want yeah creatively and yeah it is a shame that um a lot of people who are like incredibly talented don't make the living that they deserve um but if i had it one or the other i would rather have it the way it is now um and sometimes you do get folk songs that break through and in, into the mainstream you know um you get like big 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 acts like uh, Dougie McLean or or whatever who who you know do incredibly well of folk music, um, but I, I would I would rather keep it this way, where we get to do whatever we want. What sort of things do you tend to write about? I write about mental health. Um, I write about um, so I don't I don't call it political, but I do you could maybe call it like commentary, like social commentary about what's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, I try not to ever take sides or, yeah. or be like, you know, join a union, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I, I do try and just kind of say things as I see them. Um, and there's, there's definitely like, a, you know, if you listen to my songs, you can tell what sides of the spectrum I'm on, but I never try and push that. Um, and I write about relationships and yeah. loss yeah. as well. But you're in a band. You, is it a band called Pour Moi? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when you write, do you tend to write for yourself or are you writing for them? How, how does it work? Um, I just write and make the song. And sometimes when it's finished, I think, oh, that'll be great for Pour Moi or... Um, actually, this is only going to work as a solo. Pure Moi is very much a collective process. And in lockdown, you released an EP called Core Memories and Sympathetic Strings. Yeah, I released two. Um, ah. uh, one on Bandcamp of my own songs and one of um, one on Spotify, which of covers. Right. So I, I was posting a lot online, um, a lot of folk music, a lot of country songs and stuff and heard a few tracks from my youth and thought these would be funny to cover <laughs> uh, and then people seem to like them so I, I put uh, that was Spotify kind of EP together and just just put it out for people to have. The EP you released with all of your original songs what was that what was that EP called? That was called So Close Yet So Far. The title was a lockdown title um, about kind of being able to see people from your window but not being able to kind of communicate or or interact with them in any way the ep that had the covers on it and like the arrangements of existing songs did they or did that follow a particular theme in the same way that the the one of originals had uh yeah it did i i wanted it to be songs that i remember from from my, like my teenage years um that were kind of ubiquitous they were just everywhere all of the time you know they were on video games they were on tv yeah um so you know we're talking like green day blink 182 uh <laughs> offspring you know my chemical romance all all yeah. the all the big players in <laughs> in that kind of mad emo post-punk uh phase that we had in the noughties you know and do you give those songs kind of a Memphis Gerald spin, like a, a Scottish Americana spin on them. Hundred percent, yeah. And I really enjoyed it too. I would do it again. Uh, I loved it. Um, but like I said, that's that's what I like to do. You know, I like to flip songs. Now speaking about the future, what kind of things have you got? I mean, we've spoken about the album that you've got coming out um, and the Pour Moi album. Do you have anything else in the works coming up in the future? Um. No, I've actually started thinking about the next album, which I think will be, um, I'm going to go the other way around and I'm going to do like a country take on Scottish songs. 
<laughs> so I, I'm going to go in reverse. That's uh, but that's a long way. That's a long way out. Um, and no, I just working on session stuff. Um, and yeah, starting to piece together bits for the second for the second album. And if people wanted to find information about your albums, listen to your music, find out more about you, where should they look? Uh, I always send people to Instagram. I know that um, I had someone asking me about, I played last night in Newcastle and someone was asking me about Facebook. I don't really use Facebook that much. Um, I kind of do reluctantly because you kind of have to. Um, but if you really want to keep up with me and what I'm doing, and Instagram is the way to go. And what's your Instagram handle? Memphis Gerald. Memphis Gerald. Pretty straightforward. Yeah. Pretty easy peasy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, amazing. Well, thank you very much, Memphis. We are sadly running out of time, but we have time for one more song. Um, and this final song is one of my favourites. Before we hear it, just thank you very, very much for joining us today. It's been really interesting. I feel like I've learned a lot. Um, <laughs> So this final song is Worker's Song. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, I found this song, uh, well, I've been, I've been a Dick Gawkin fan for for years. Um, and I've always loved his arrangement of this song. It's not originally his song, um, but I've, I've reworked it back into my live set and stuff because um, of all the stuff going on with the unions right now. Um, and it's, it's scary how relevant the lyrics are, even though it was written at least 60 years ago. Oh, come all you workers, you toil night and day by hand and by brain to earn your pay before centuries long past from no more than bread a plate for your countries and county to bed in the factories and mills in the shipyards and mines we've often been told to keep up with the times for our skills are not needed they've streamlined their job and with slight rule and stop watch your pride they have wrong Thank you for watching. Our next session will be two weeks from today at 8pm. For more information about our Future Tuesday Folk People sessions, podcasts and other events, please sign up to our mailing list or keep an eye on our social media and website. Well, it's listen a while unto my song And then perhaps you'll understand what and how we have been doing since